Hello class, today we're going to be looking at the different revolutions that took place in the world. We're going to start first with the American Revolution, but before we got to the American Revolution, there were several events that took place. One of the events was the Scientific Revolution. Um, it wasn't really a fight or a war, it was just a revolution of thinking and inventions that took place. Um, looking at the scientific revolution, it is going to lead to the Enlightenment era, which we already talked about the Enlightenment era last week. The Enlightenment era is going to consist of what is called the age of reason, where people are going to start brainstorming different ideas on how they think society and the government should run. Um, looking at some of the Enlightenment philosophers from last week, look, we looked at Locke and Rousseau. And Locke discussed natural rights, and those natural rights was life, liberty, and property. Jefferson's going to change it into life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. Um, looking at Rousseau, which John Locke believed in the aspect of social contract too, that basically is an unspoken agreement by which people allow themselves to be governed. When you guys come to Durant Road Middle School, you'll allow the teachers to govern you by, you know, putting away your, your cell phones, not bringing any of your electronics, in the belief that we will rule or teach you guys um, and not violate your rights. So th the same thing when you look at the United States government. We let the government rule over us, but in the same regards, we expect the government to protect our rights, too. And any time the government violates this social contract, then the people have a right to overthrow that government, which is going to add to our Declaration of Independence. The American Revolution is going to be the first colonial rebellion, because originally we did belong to England. England is going to colonize the 13 colonies um, against the parent country. It was inspired by the Enlightenment ideals of natural rights, social contract, fairness. And I do apologize about this board. It got messed up in the movement. But events leading to the American Revolution. And this is where you need to take out your timeline that I um, distribute to you today in class. You don't have to write anything down because I already filled in the answers to the questions. But the first thing on your timeline um, is the Seven Years' War. And like I said, you need to have this sheet out. Um, if you look. The first question was, why was this significant to the American Revolution? Well, the Seven Years' War, which we discussed in class today, is going to cause heavy taxation for the colonies because the British Empire has to find some way to, one, pay for the war and then support the troops that are now in the new land protecting the colonies. So they are going to issue several different taxes, one being the Stamp Act and the Townsend Act. Um, the Stamped Act is going to be taxes on paper products, and then the Townsend Act, if you look, is just tax, paper, tea, glass, lead, and some paints. But all the Stamped Act is paper products such as newspapers, um, legal documents, license, and cards. So this war is going to cause heavy taxation to the, colon to the colonists. The first two taxes, like I said, is going to be the Stamped Act and Townsend Act. The colonists are not going to be happy about these taxes. They're going to start abusing the tax collectors, like they're going to pour tar on them and feather them, which is going to cause the British government to send soldiers over to the New World to basically make sure that the colonies stay in line with their rules and regulations and that they're paying their taxes. And so they know that, hey, I am absolute monarch. Y'all are going to listen to what I want y'all to do. Well, this is not going to go over well with the, colon the colonists. And it, we're going to have an event, and it's going to be called the Boston Massacre. Not a lot of people died in that massacre, only five, but it is called a massacre because the colonists said that they did not have any weapons, and they just threw, they were throwing either snowballs or rocks. Two different books always say two different things. Uh, well, it's two books that say two different things about what they actually threw. But in the end, they threw something at the British soldiers, and they claimed that the British soldiers fired on them and they didn't have any weapons, so that's why they call it a massacre. The important thing about the Boston Massacre is Crispus Ackes. He's going to be the first African American to die, basically, in the American Revolution, because he died in the Boston Massacre. So he is one of the five that were killed by the British soldiers. Um, they did go to trial, and the British soldiers were found not guilty, which upset the colonists. It's going to increase the tension between the 13 colonies in Britain. Britain already know there's tension
attention, but the king goes ahead and issues another tax. And this is the tax on tea. This is called the Tea Act. The colonists are going to get together. They form a group called the Sons of Liberty. They are against what the king is doing to the colonists. And eventually they're going to encourage the colonists to break away. So they are going to create this group called the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty, they're going to dress up like Native Americans and board British ships and pour the tea overboard. This is called the Boston Tea Party. Of course, this is going to upset the British crown because they are losing a lot of money from tea being thrown in the ocean. So they decide to pass the Coercive Acts, which the colonists call the Intolerable Acts because it basically suspends all their civil rights. So it's like our government taking away our Bill of Rights, taking all our rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and limiting our rights because of something that we did. Um, they also go forward and, is and issue what is called the Quartering Act. That British soldiers can now go to any colonist's home and sleep in their home, live in their home, eat anything that they want out of their home without the colonist's permission. They don't have to ask. So, of course, the colonists become even more upset about what the British government is doing to them. So they decide to start having meetings. The first meeting is going to be called the First Continental Congress. During this meeting, the colonists really do not want to break away from England. They just want England to stop taxing them. They want England to understand their point of view. They are scared of England because at this point in history, England is a really, really strong empire, strong government. So you are going to have two sides that are going to form. You're going to have the loyalists and the, um, the patriots. The patriots are going to be against the, the British crown, and then the loyalists are, are the ones that are going to remain loyal to the king. Um, hence, that's where you get the movie The Patriot. So you're going to have the First Continental Congress, because they really didn't want to break away from England during this time, they are going to decide to boycott the British goods that they are taxing them. They're hoping, hey, if we boycott the British goods, then they'll stop taxing us. Well, that doesn't work. The British government also passes what is called the Navigation Acts. And it tells the colonists that they can no longer trade with any other European countries but Britain. This hurts the colonists' finances because now they can only trade with one European country. They don't like the Navigation Act. Um, they, don't like the Boss they don't like the Boston Massacre, what happened with that. They don't like the Intolerable Acts, which are called the Coercive Acts. They definitely hate the Quartering Act. So they decide to have another meeting. This is called the Second Continental Congress meeting. During this meeting, if you flip back to the back page. During this meeting, they decide, hey, we're going to form an army, and we're going to appoint a person in charge of that army. And that, that person that was appointed in charge of the army is George Washington, which he will later become our first president. Um, so they decide to go to war with England. It's also during this meeting that they discuss the Declaration of Independence. So the war is going to begin, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. The Declaration of Independence is going to start being written by Thomas Jefferson. At this time, Tom Je Thomas Jefferson is very young. He's only 33 years old. Um, he is going to be the main author of the Declaration of Independence, and we're going to talk more about that document in a minute. Um, Common Sense is also going to be published by Thomas Paine. Remember, there are still some colonists that do not want to leave England. They are scared. So Thomas Paine writes this book and says, you know, it doesn't make any sense that y'all letting this European country that's on the other side of the world rule over these 13 colonies. It only makes sense to break away from this government that is so far away. And keep in mind, the king let the colonies create their own type of government, which I told you in class, it was called solitary neglect. But now when the king wants money and needs taxes, now he wants to rule over the colonies. They're just not used to that. So July 2nd, 1776 is when the Declaration of Independence is going to be finalized, but we celebrate July 4th, 1776, because that's when it's read across the, really the world, that England's 13 colonies is breaking away. Um, it is said that the Declaration of Independence is meant to be read aloud versus just sitting there reading it um, to express the colonists' um, basically ideals on why they want to break away from England. So, like I said, it was written by Thomas Jefferson. In his writing, he's going to use several enlightenment beliefs in the document. One, John Locke. He is going to believe in life, liberty, and property. These are your natural rights. 
Thomas Jefferson is going to agree with John Locke, but he's going to change the last part of property, and he's going to say pursuit of happiness, that these are our natural rights, and that all men are given these rights. These are inalienable rights that all men are given at the time of birth. One thing about this document is it does not address the issue of slavery. It did at first, and then the founding fathers told Thomas Jefferson to take it out because they, they knew that they were going to still continue slavery because he did blame slavery on the king. So this life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness did not apply to slaves. He also liked what Rousseau said, the whole social contract between people and the government. So he's going to list the abuses of the king in the document. As we read the document, or as you read it tomorrow for homework, you will see that it says, he did this, he did this, he did that. He's talking about King George. Um, the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence is finally going to declare the colonies free and independent states of the British Empire. They no longer recognize themselves as part of the British Empire. Just because this document was written, though, did not mean that they were automatically independent. They had to go to war with England, and in the end, we are going to win the war, and we're going to form our own government. Our first form of government that we're going to form is going to be called the Articles of Confederation. The problem with the Articles of Confederation was they were too rigid. It was hard to make changes to the Articles of Confederation. It's going to cause dispute within the colonies because each colony is really going to govern themselves as individuals and not as a whole like we do now in the United States of America. Like they're going to, each colony is going to have their own type of currency, which is money. They're not going to have the same currency. Um, most of the power in the Articles of Confederation remained in the states. So each state was doing their own different thing, um, and the federal government basically had no power to do anything. It all is going to come to a head with Daniel Shea's rebellion and another issue with taxation, heavy taxation on farmers. The federal government basically had no power to enforce taxes on everyone, so the farmers were getting heavily taxed. Of course, the farmers are upset, so they decide to rebel against a federal arsenal. It's 1,200 farmers. It's led by Daniel Shea. And they decide to go ahead and rebel against the federal arsenal or against federal government saying you need to do something. It's at this time that our founding fathers, such as George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson could not attend the Constitutional Convention. They're going to say, hey, we need to do something. We need to change our government or we need to make changes to the Articles of Confederation. And they are, and I'm going to talk more about the Articles of Confederation on the next board, which is going to lead to the Constitution. Again, is going to draw on a Lightning philosopher, Montesquieu. He's going to say, look, there should be three branches of government, and those three branches of government should be separate, and they should all have their individual powers. And this is where we get the legislative, executive, and judicial branch of government because of Montesquieu. We go from having a strong state power government to having a strong federal government, which we use today. If the federal government makes a law, all 50 states have to follow that law. With the Articles of Confederation, that would not have been the case. Each 13 colony or state had their own different laws. In order to make this document, they are going to meet in Philadelphia. It is going to be a secret. They're not going to let the 13 colonies or the people of the 13 colonies know that the government is being changed because if they did that, it probably would have caused chaos. So during this meeting in Philadelphia, several compromises are going to be made, and you're going to talk in more detail next year in U.S. history about the Great Compromise, which we use today, and that's Congress, where you have the Senate as the upper house, the House of Representatives as the lower house, and it's going to combine the New Jersey plan and the Virginia plan. The Virginia plan was written by James Madison, and he's later going to become known as the father of the Constitution, just like Thomas Jefferson is the father of the Declaration of Independence. Um, the larger states wanted Congress to be represented strictly by population. Well, if you're a small state like Rhode Island, you're not going to like that. You're, gonna, you're not going to have as much representation in Congress as a state like Virginia or New York will. So they came up with this compromise where they said the Senate, regardless of the size of the state, you will have two senators per state. So today we have 100 senators because we have 50 states. 
The lower house, the House of Representatives, is based on population, which made the larger states happy. That's why it's called the Great Compromise, and it's still working today because we have 435 members in the House of Representatives. We have 100 members in the Senate, which gives us 535 members in Congress. Um, the three-fifths compromise was the southern states wanted to count the slaves as part of their population. The northern states have said, no, that's not fair, because remember, there are more slaves in the south than there is in the north. So what the compromise was, five slaves would be counted as three persons. That made everyone happy. Another compromise is called the Electoral College on how we elect our president. And basically, we do not directly elect our president. We elect electors that will go place our district vote. And based on the number of electors in each state, the president has to at least get 270 electors to win. Y'all will talk about this in greater detail in U.S. history next year. And the last and biggest compromise of them all, keep in mind, some colonists still feared a strong federal government. They wanted the power to remain in the states because they didn't want another dictator or absolute monarch to take place. So in order for them to sign off on this document, because we needed nine out of 13 states to sign off on the Constitution, they had to add a Bill of Rights. And we will talk in great detail about the Bill of Rights later on this week. But it's our first 10 amendments to the Constitution that gives us freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, right to a speedy and public trial. All that comes from the Bill of Rights. So it sounds like our government is great, but let me tell you why, again, we love the Articles of Confederation. It was our first form of government, but the power lies within the states, not federal government. And that's because they feared having another monarchy. It was a very weak government because federal government had absolutely no power to do anything. We had no president in the Articles of Confederation, so you had no single leader because, again, they feared having a monarchy. There was no judicial branch, meaning there was no Supreme Court to check the other branches. Nine out of 13 states had to agree to make a law, which it was hard to get all 19, nine states to agree on something. So laws really didn't get made. And it, in order to make a change to the Articles of Confederation, you needed all 13 states to agree. So that's why when they went to Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention, that's why they had to throw this document completely out because all 13 states couldn't agree on anything. If you look prior, I just list all the different compromises that had to be made, made for this document to get signed, the Constitution. So looking at the Constitution, there are certain principles that the Constitution has. You have federalism, which is powers shared between federal and state government. Example of that would be taxes. You pay state taxes, but you also pay federal taxes. Um, education is a power that is given only to state. The government or federal government does not make educational laws for each individual state. So like the state of North Carolina, we used to have civics in the 10th grade, and the state of Virginia has civics in the 12th grade. We have recently just moved civics to the 12th grade, but it didn't have to be the same as Virginia because that is a, it is a state power. Popular sovereignty means that the power lies within the people. It is the consent of the governed. And we exercise this power by voting for our leaders. Checks and balances and separation of powers go with the three branches of government, and each branch checks each other. That's why um, not one branch is powerful than the other. Like President Obama right now, he wants to go to war or do military action against Syria. He can't do military action against Syria without the approval of Congress. That is an example of checks and balances. Then the supremacy clause. No one is above the Constitution, not even our leaders. Our president can get impeached if they do something wrong that's against the law. And it's basically saying that states are second power to federal government because of the supremacy clause. Now the structure of the Constitution is the first part is the preamble, and it tells the purpose of the Constitution. The second part is the article. And the first three articles create the structure of our government. Article 1 is the legislative branch. Article 2 is the executive branch. Article 3 is the judicial branch. Article 4 says that states must respect each other's laws. Article 5 describes the amendment process. Article 6 
is your supremacy clause. And then Article 7 says that 9 out of 13 states had to sign off on this document in order for it to take place. And then the good thing about the Constitution is it's very flexible. Remember, the Articles of Confederation was too rigid. With the Constitution, you can make changes. So we have already made 27 changes to our Constitution, and these changes are called amendments. We immediately made changes to our Constitution with the Bill of Rights. Even before the document was signed, they had already added the first 10 amendments, and those are the Bill of Rights because they were making the changes to this document. Um, ending of slavery is your 13th Amendment. That was a change made. Um, change the voting age from 21 to 18 was another change. So my question for you, do you think the American colonies was committing treason when they broke away from England? Because anybody that signed the Declaration of Independence, if we did not win, they would have been killed for treason. So that's your homework assignment that I want y'all to answer is was the American colonies committing treason by breaking away from England or going to war? Thank you.